Hello again, it's Glenn Walford here and welcome to the Franchise Everything podcast where we talk about everything and anything related to franchising and I'm at the actual Goncha headquarters in Sydney today which is Bubble Tea brand with the master franchisee Lily Shee here in Australia. Hello Lily, how are you? Hi Glenn, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having us today. Thank you. And I know we've done a store tour already today, we've done some other interviews and everything there so it's been a great day so far. Thanks for having us. Um, This is all about you though. We're going to talk about you and your business journey and how you've done what you've done. Um, now, I've always said, it, and, th- and if anyone's seen the other content we've done with you today and your team, um, I've been uh, saying quite a bit that you'd be very much under the radar in franchising in Australia and not many would realise that Gong Char is 145 plus stores in the Australian market. So we're going to talk about how you did that. Um, but let's start with how you started in business. What's your, what's your story and how you got started? In 2010, I had a, a crepe business, uh, a Japanese crepe business, and I'd grown it to four, four stores, which was also franchised. So you did franchise that business? That's yeah. right. So I had, it was a franchise from Japan. Um, mm-hmm. So I actually flew there to, to learn the whole whole trade. Um, and we had three three franchises. How did you, how did you decide on a crepe business? Well, the story goes a bit before that. Um, I became a mum in two thousand end of two thousand and nine, and straightly sh- shortly after that, my husband went bankrupt at the time, mm-hmm. and then I was gifted seventy thousand dollars for my parents, um, which was for the purpose of buying a house to get to get you on your feet. And that's all, right, yeah. because um, we didn't have a place to stay. Um, and I actually took my family back to my parents' house to live there. Um, so with that $70,000, I went against their wishes and I started the crepe business. I partnered up with my primary school friend. We, we went, you know, so we had $150,000. We started mm. the crepe business and that's how things started. That's where it started. Yeah. So you ran over that really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure yeah. why. So, um, okay, so you uh, you started the family and everything and things went a little pear-shaped there, obviously. That's right. So what made you decide to, your solution to that circumstance to look at a business? Well, Where did that come from? Because at the time I felt that I didn't have enough skills or knowledge or experience to start my own business to create a business. Mm-hmm. So I, I started discovering franchising. You didn't even look at an employ- employment? Uh, like a no. Job? <laughs> didn't I, come I didn't, into your mind? Because I was a new mom and I couldn't yeah. commit to a full-time job. My, my mm. baby at the time was five months old. So, yeah. Yeah. But that, actually, that's really it's an insight into your mindset, I yeah, think, saying yeah. that, that you couldn't commit to that, so you went entrepreneurship instead. Yeah. So much more stable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> it's a very interesting <laughs> approach. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's what happened and uh, uh, and it's it's been an uphill, I guess, since yeah. then. Yeah. So the um, – the crepe business. So why crepes? So what 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 attracted you because to that type of business? Because we didn't have that in Australia, uh, yeah. not in Sydney, um, and it, it, uh, people are very familiar with with crepes, French crepes, but not so much with Japanese crepes, where they had savory and sweet. Um, and the difference between that with the French crepes was that it was a grab and go. So mm. um, we can, I, we can invest very little. It doesn't have to be a restaurant. So it wasn't it wasn't a big location with no, fit out. No, it was and, a kiosk. Was grab and go. Yeah. Yeah. And whereabouts was that? In World Square in Sydney, and yeah. I worked in there for two years. <laughs> two years, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but mind you, you did two years and four stores and yeah. three franchise. How how did you set about franchising? Like you obviously didn't know much about franchising. I'm guessing. No, I didn't at the time. So we we were exploring. Um, as we as we went, but then we also had the support of the team at the back in Japan at the time. Um, so I did learn a lot. That was my huge learning curve in franchising in that two years. Yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around it. That you just <laughs> decided you're going to jump in and be a franchisor. That's so, right. Because well, I thought, were you nervous? Like what, um, what was the, the well? What happened was um, the business was doing really really good. Um, mm-hmm. There were lines out the door every day and then we were being approached by people wanting to open the same business and that's when we thought, oh, you know, we can we can go the franchise way. So when you went to Japan and you got this, found this brand and did all that, were you thinking of franchising at no, that stage? No, I just wanted to open maybe a store or two. And Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you didn't have this massive grand ambition to a big no, empire? Not at all. I just, I just wanted to have an income. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't ambitious Sorry, at I all. can't get my head around it. <laughs> it wasn't ambitious at all, no. No, wow, yeah. and there was this ambition. Yeah. So, okay, so um, h- how did you franchise it? So what help did they give you? Because obviously they're in Japan. Yeah. So when I know watching other international brands franchise in the Australian market, it's not always so easy for them to help from it a was, remote location? It was word of mouth by word of mouth. So yeah. it was people who tried the product, love the product, mm-hmm. and, and that that's the same story with, you know, Gongcha, mm. the, the 10 years after that. It was 
word of mouth and their, their passion for the brand and then the love for the product. Mm. Yeah, so they approached us and we want to open our store. Can you help us do that? So how how did it work on a daily basis? So with the family, with the growing family, yes. um, how did you how did you function? What 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 was it, what was that like in running a crepe business and then opening three franchises inside I, two years? I was uh, the one man show for 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 a good two years. So you know, uh, working in the store and and talking to the franchisees, yeah, it just it happened because you had to. Mm. Yeah. So. And where were the other locations? So were they? We close had one by? in Adelaide, and the other two were in Sydney. So you, you went like interstate franchising. That's, was that your first one, was it? Yes. Yeah, so and that's what started the Gongcha journey. Yeah. Um, because the franchising Adelaide had wanted he had a huge store and he didn't want only want crepes in it because our concept was grab and go. So yep. he had So a, you had a fairly narrow offer as far as that grab and go, that was it. Correct. Okay. And yep. then so he wanted to offer bubble tea along with crepes. So he had approached uh, a bubble tea brand at the time, and then he in and in the end he had the two concepts in the one store. So how, how did how did you work through that with him? Is that something you were happy with, or oh yeah? So yeah. then that, I just had to set up the store for him to sell crepes, and then yes. he basically just had two businesses okay. in the one location, yeah. and that was my light bulb moment. So what what was the light bulb about it? I'm thinking well, because I'm a crepe person crepe background at the time. <laughs> so you've now identified thinking, yourself as a crepe person. Yeah, yeah, at, yeah. at the time, I'm thinking, well, I want to sell my crepes, right? But mm. s- if I can entice more people to join up to complement the crepes, I should have a bubble tea brand. Mm. And and so then I did some homework, a lot of homework, and I went to Taiwan and tasted multiple brands. So what yeah. did you see about bubble tea at that time? Thinking back, what year was this? This was in 2011. Okay, so what did you see about bubble tea in the Australian market? Because I imagine bubble tea in the Australian market at that time wasn't very big outside of CBDs, I'd imagine. That, that's correct, yes. Yeah, so what did you see about it? Uh, well, bu- bubble tea at, at the time, it wasn't huge, but then there was still a demand for it within the Asian community at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I th- and, and big crepes, it's, it's a Japanese Japanese crepe being an Asian product. I, I thought that they the, the marriage was perfect. They complemented each other really, really well. So, um, and it was it was the time I didn't think about growing the bubble tea brand at the time. It was more oh, I just it was a side. So it was another one of those little non-empire things you were just going to add on a that's little bubble right, tea. That's right. To just give more offer offering to the customer, to more choice. You, that you was didn't just come up with one yourself, but you had to go to Taiwan to look for one. That's incredible. Again, it's the lack of experience. Yeah, yeah. And I, I needed something really, really good because I think the bubble tea, uh, the 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 market was quite. Uh, we had a few well-known brands in Australia yes. at, at that time, yeah. and um, it needed to be something better. Yeah, so you want to, to, be, to so you, stand out. So you you knew bubble tea well enough to know that you think it needs to be done better. That's to be right. Able to, yeah. That's right to, for it to survive. And yeah, then, yeah. So tell me about that um, journey. So did you? Ha, how much bubble tea did you see around you? For example, so there what, were only two players at the time. Okay. Yeah. And what, and you just you thought it could be done better than that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And now I know you were telling me, and I'm, I'm trying to get it out of you, you're not giving it to me. You you off air, you were saying about that you had a bubble tea store very close to you, to your crepe business. That's right. That's what I was trying to get. Oh, to. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so tell me about that, about what you were seeing about turnover. Yeah, so I was everything. running my crepe business and mm. right next to me, um, th- that was the the bubble tea store. Uh, we shared a wall. The two, wow. we had, there were two kiosks. Little did they know a future competitor was right there, right next door. Um, I'll give you another in- interesting um information piece of information is that we have since taken over that site um i think it was last year mm-hmm. uh and now we run run the bubble tea in that location where With i your was brand. neighbors that, that's right yes wow. so they were doing their bubble tea thing i was doing my crepe thing and i and i noticed of course the demand for the product and i thought you know i can i, can, I think i can do better Excellent. So, yeah. all right. So you've on the search looking. Thank God for the internet. I reckon that you're on the search Absolutely, looking. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. So we're better than obviously the Asian market to have a look at bubble tea brands That's to bring right. into the Australian. So tell me about your assessment process because Gong Cha was obviously who you've ended up with. That's thankfully. right. That's but right. But what was your assessment like in your research prior to? So I had that? organized meetings with multiple brands in Taiwan that weren't in Australia at the time, and I had set up meetings with. So, them. Sorry, why Taiwan? Why, why Taiwan? That's where think? tapioca came from. The, okay. the, 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 so milk tea and tea has been around forever, but to put tapioca balls, the, the pearls as mm-hmm. we call it, into the drink, that came from Taiwan. Okay. So makes sense. Where, where else yeah. to go other than the, where, where the product was born, right? 
Yeah. So that's where I went and I, I spoke to multiple brand owners, how they saw their brand, how their product is. Mm. So how, how many do you think you spoke to or research seriously? Yeah. And how did they receive you? Was there varying degrees of interest and how, how did they receive an approach the, from Australia like that from you? Yeah, so the conversation didn't go as very far, but at that time everyone was very keen to to go out into a Western country like Australia um, because bubble tea at that time was still mainly in Southeast Asia and they were all keen to see if they can venture out into. Oh, so, you, so Australia was maybe a, a safe tight Western market for them to trial. Yep. you know, uh, yeah, like a migration country, absolutely. So they thought it would be uh, the perfect place to, to test the market. Yeah. 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 Okay. And and obviously several brands have come out here, haven't they? Oh, now we, I think we've got over 20 brands. Wow. Yeah. 20 brands. Okay, so you're, you're touring around Taiwan trying bubble tea and having meetings. Um, what, tell me about that. Tell me about that journey because I know it's actually the reason why I drill in on this is that I'm sure there's a lot of people who have got these passions for brands that they want to bring. There's a lot of people who want to bring brands into the Australian market about how you, Totally Green, how you went about it. It's, yeah. a, re- it's, a, it's a really interesting yeah, so, thing. So initially it was just learning about the brand and trying their products and seeing and, and comparing it to what we have already in Australia um, because it has to be better um, mm-hmm. for it to, to work in Australia. It can't be second best, then you won't because there, there's a lot of competitors. I mean, there were two big players, but there's a lot of individual mom and dad run stores. Oh, in the Australian well, market, Australia, yes. That's yeah. right. So in order for, for it to stand out, it must be really, really good. So um, I started with the taste of the product. I need to like it because I'm a huge bubble tea fan. Yeah. So I know the, the differences, I guess, the, the good and the bad. So in Taiwan, I tasted all the different bands brand's products, I spoke to the owners and they were giving me how they see their brand and how they want it, their vision for the brand. Mm. And that's where I sort of decided on which one. Mm. Yeah. So Gong Sha presented a better vision yeah. from your perspective. And the product. As soon as I tasted, I knew that this is going to work and we're people are going to go nuts for it. Mm. Yeah. So what did the due diligence process go like then next with from you and from Gong Cha? How, how did that work out? Um, at that time, it was a family business, so uh, it was a lot simpler back in the day. And that, I think you said previously in an in interview, did you had about two hundred locations at that time? They that had right? two hundred locations, yes, yes, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, um, Malaysia, Taiwan, of course. So when I when I went there, I just had to show them and convince them that I was the right candidate to bring the brand to Australia and to make it make it a success. How did you do that? passion mm. and then a lot of talking because I did lack in experience and I did lack in capital funding. So I didn't come from uh, like, you know, the position I was in before the crepe and then the crepe. I wasn't showered with a huge uh, fund that I can say, you know, I'm going to open 50 stores in, in two years. I wasn't able to, to offer that to them. I didn't have a very pretty resume of, you know, 20 years in food and beverage. I had two years in food and beverage. Mm. So it was really my love for the product and my love for the brand. So I went back to Taiwan three times to meet with the owners. Is that to keep convincing? Yes. 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 I'm thinking because I'm, I'm I'm trying to visualize that because I can imagine brands if a, a brand at around 200 locations has got a desire to get into the Western marketplace and seeing Australia as a yes. as an entry, I can imagine that they would be looking for people or. Equip, businesses well with equipped. scaled, scaled hospitality type businesses That's to take right. into the market. That's right. So, the, what what do you think was the thing that maybe you, I know you say passion? It is what so true, think, though. You reckon? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because I was there three times, and then once I had, I think around thirty stores. The owners visited Australia, and they were in the warehouse with me. And we had mm-hmm. a small conversation. They said, "You know, we had so many better candidates than you at the time." And I'm like, "Yeah, I, I can imagine." Because mm-hmm. um, the other, the other master franchises in other countries, they were running multiple brands. Yes. Yeah, and I was uh, a rookie in that regard. So there were multiple brand operators or Co- added gong cha That's to right. their existing. That's right, huge business background. Mm. And, and they said, but, you know, we trusted you because, you know, you're young and not much experience, but then just your love for the product and your passion convinced us. And then, and then they said, you know, we made the right choice, which was It would have been hugely amazing. satisfying. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you – so – Let's go there. So you've you've got the deal. Yeah. So h- how did you find out that you were awarded the license or the master franchise rights oh, to Australia? Was what was that like? Forth. So I, I I went there multiple times. You know, three times. Um, I I 
kept talking to them and then in the end they just agreed to my terms which was you just wore them down you kept yeah, them. yeah and it was it was great yeah. so what was that moment like when you um when you found out was it like an email or was it a letter or was it a call oh, or face to face it was an email mm. because we've been I've, I've been trying to negotiate as well not only was I not as well equipped you know with the funds and with experience I was all, I was also trying to get the best deal you were trying well. to negotiate <laughs> That's so right. I'm not I'm not skilled. I haven't got the experience or That's all right. the money, but I want I want a cheaper price. That's right. And, and well, what I offered to them this, mm. at the time was a wing wing situation because it's, it's, it's normal. Um, you know, when you get a master franchise, you pay a lump sum for the license yes. fee, and you start opening stores. So then I said, can we do a better deal? We, I'll pay you a little bit less because I don't have that much funds, but maybe I'll pay you some every time I open a store. So if I do get to fifty, you 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 get double the franchise fee, and that's they agreed to that. So you back end, you try to back end. So now, of course, you know, it's 100% a win-win situation because they would have gotten a lot, lot more than what they would oh, have had if it term. was a straight fee. That, that's right. Because now we've got no, over 145 locations. Mm. Yeah. So what, that's a great story. So what, um, <laughs> Uh, what what sort of preparation did you have to do? So so you signed the deal, yeah. you got that done. Yeah. Um, so you got the master rights. So for anyone who don't know, can you describe what the master rights arrangement is or a master franchisee that's for Australia actually, looks like? That's actually a huge responsibility um, yep. because then I'm – uh, responsible for the whole Australian market for the brand. So anyone who wants to open a gongcha has to come to me. So mm -hmm. and and that's how how it is. So the 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 life of the brand basically is on my shoulders. Yes. <laughs> yeah. D big responsibility. That's right. No 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 pressure at all. <laughs> no. Yeah. So um, what's the preparation like? So what do they require of you? So for they for that for to, you to get ready. Yeah. So I went there for two weeks to do the training. I mean mm -hmm. because. It was a family business at the time and it was bare bones. So I, I was there for two, I think two to three weeks, learning how to make the tea on the ground in the stores, learning the trade and then... What was that like? Were you, were you, was it, did anything surprise you or worry you or did you get nervous about anything? Oh, no, I was tested. No, nothing was worrying, but I was tested, you know, uh, going back to studying the recipes. Did and you have memory. pressure that you had to perform to? Oh, oh yeah. Because I imagine you have to pass training essentially. To yeah, I remember probably. I was operating on a budget, so I can't say, oh, stay for a month. And then and then I also have a kid to look after. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so yes, of course. There's all these things happening at the same time. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so you did your two weeks training. And what sort of um, – did you have restrictions on you? What sort of what what sort of guidance and everything did you have? Or I know that because when some brands do international rights to this market or to any market for that matter, they can be really restrictive and pretty tight on their rules that they yeah. require them follow, yeah. and others can be really open and just have really open. open. That. Yeah. At, at that time, because I think they were still expanding, so they gave they gave me the very basics of you know what the stores are to look like, what the logos are, and you know these are the recipes. And then that was pretty much it. So that, and then I looked for a location for about six months, mm -hmm. and I managed to open a store in 2011, end of 2011. So okay, so you're over here. So you looked for the location. What what were you looking for in a location? So in your mind, yes. never having opened a bubble tea business, yes. did they help you with location principles no, and strategies? Not at all, because because it is pretty hard, obviously, when they're not in this market That's as right. well. That's I can imagine right. new demographics yeah. and all and that. They sort had of limited thing. resources. Yeah. Okay. So what were you looking for in the first location? Um, it had to be in the CBD. Mm -hmm. And it had to be within budget. Okay. Yeah. So um, I managed to find uh, 601 George Street. That was the very first. It's on George Street in, in Sydney, Sydney, which yep. is a very busy uh, location. Um, the rental on it was reasonable at the time. Yep. yep. The rental on it was reasonable at the time because yep. it had a very uh, narrow frontage. And yep. that was Perfect it. for you. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. That's, yes. That's right. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that's great. So, um, and you had that vision. So you signed that lease 2011, did you say? Yes. Yeah, and when did you get it? How long did it take you to get it open? Oh, I think two months. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, two that's months. Good. And then I, I, I was that one-man show for the next three years, I would say, or two, two to three years, up until about 2014 when I had my first hire. <laughs> so was, I was I was what I called a briefcase company. Mm -hmm. So I had a, you know, like a briefcase and then in it, you know, I'm the different cards. I'm the designer. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard oh, that. Oh, you haven't? No. So no, no office. <laughs> okay, I have heard. I have so heard I carry it around with me, and that's it. Right, that's a company. I have heard stories of maybe it's Peters of Kensington or something right. where 
that they were trying to look bigger than they were and then they would call and someone say, hang on, I'll put you through to Dave in shipping and I go, hello, Dave in shipping and I have a different voice each time. That's it's, my vision. It's, exact, it's that, exactly like is that. Is that what you were like? That's right. So I would help um, the franchisees when they open. I'll help them make the tea. I'll yeah. be their support in the store. Um, I was working in my own stores as well, mm. uh, doing the rostering, just everything that you can imagine. What was it like managing a shop fit first time, fitting out a, a retail or a, a food retail well, business? for me at the time, I I only cared about the budget. So, I mean, since then, you know, it's you know about quality, about the materials. I'm mm. a bit more, you know, um, educated. More on things, That's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. Um, but at the, at the time it was just, you know, whoever can fit the budget and, and come up with the design, then that's all. You got the job. You got the gig. That's right. You yeah. got the job. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And if you can finish it in time so it doesn't eat into the rental free period. And oh, I yes, absolutely. Rent, that's Get right. in to start making money Yeah, as so as that's why I think – now I am just so aware of cost savings for the franchisees because I've been there and done that mm. and I know how every dollar counts, mm. like when you're setting up the business. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you talked earlier today when we had a discussion about uh, rent-free periods and rent contributions that landlords give you pass all of that straight back to franchisees because of that reason. That's right, yes. Yeah. So, um, okay, that's 2011. Open your first store. Yeah. Um, how many franchises did you open up in those two years when you were a one one person show? What was that like? Eleven. Eleven stores That's on your right. own. Yeah. So um, I opened up the second store myself uh, mm-hmm. three months later in Marker City in Sydney. Yep. Um, so the first store was in August, and the second one was around November, December. And then after that, we had Melbourne, we had Adelaide, um, a few in Sydney. And that's all me sort of going to the stores, talking to the franchisees as a business development, mm. um, talking to the designer as, you know, the, the design design team, um, supporting the the store, ordering the equipment for them. I, I did everything. And it was wow. it was possible. Yeah. I think every every franchisor watching or listening to this must be shaking in their boots, thinking of the thought of that 11 stores on their own yeah, um, yeah. while running their own stores at the same time. It's and and some remarkable. of them were interstate, yeah. Wow. And that was um, with the stock in the garage. That, that too? That, so sto- that's right. Stock was piled up. <laughs> was it right. tapioca piled I, up in the garage? I, I went from a single garage to a double garage to a yep. triple garage. So yes, that's, that's great. because it was necessary. That's right. Wow. Okay, so that's 2013. Yes. So when, your, when was your, what was your first hire to bring on to help you? Oh, then that, that would have been George. Yep. Yeah, business development. So um, he's the proper first hire. Before, before George, we had um, store managers because then I'm going to help the franchisees. I'm not in the store so much. Yes. Then we, we started to have store managers. And then the store managers then, then sort of be- became regional managers, then became inspect- inspectors, trainers, and went, went from there. So what, we, what were the main problems you were, you were confronting then? What were the main issues you were dealing with then in that early stages of a business from zero to 11, mm. apart from probably not sleeping? What were, your, what were your other main issues you think with business-wise? Oh, I... For, for for us, I think it's the the product consistency because we, you know, early on we had stores in different states, so we just really had to make sure, like, because I was choosing all the franchisees, face to face meetings, getting to know them before we sign on. So in order to deliver product consistency, but um, but without the support staff, because remember I was the one person, mm. um, I needed to make sure that they were the right operators, that they will do the right thing. And, you know, they have the best interest in the business. So that was really important and that they had to love the brand. Um, and I believe that that would help them run the business the right way, if yep. that makes sense. Yes, yeah. yeah. It, it seems, it strikes me that, um, and looking in the store today when we were wandering around the store, it strikes me as controlled chaos. Like it was really busy, like people were yeah. running around and there's people running around with bowls and scoops and stuff everywhere. But it also seems simple at the same time in some yeah, way. Yeah. And that, that sort of strikes me when you talk about you running it all yourself and having, because when you say that you're first, you know, you had franchisee in Adelaide and then you had one in Sydney and everything like that, it, it feels spread. But it feels like quite a simple business to run. Would you describe it as that from a franchisee perspective? I, I think, think that's so. part of the secret. Yes. Uh, look, the hardest part of it is probably training the staff. And then once you have the staff, then that's it. Like it's it's methodical, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we, you're, at, you're at 11, you've got a hire, you started rolling. Now you, you've obviously accelerated because you're at nearly 150 stores now yes. in 2023. So w- what was the progression along there? So what were the key things that were happening from 11 stores then when you got that first hire? Um, once we got to 11 stores, then I can start spending time on promoting the brand because we didn't do any marketing until about 
two years ago, it was we relied on word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Yes, so it was word of mouth. It was so not, um, not a lot of local area marketing and all that sort oh, of stuff. Oh, we did that. So yeah. they will have very lo- very localized, okay, you know, very tight sort of bro- brochures, for example, yeah. something very very simple. But we yes. didn't do mass major marketing. campaigns and everything that, like national right. campaigns. That's okay. right. Yeah. So it was we rely completely on word of mouth and on you know how the customers see the brand and that they want to own their own own store. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, in 2014 we did I remember we did uh, a concert Jay Chow, which is a huge celebrity in in Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. He was in for a concert and we wanted to uh, sponsor the concert, which is by giving vouchers and. It was yes. a very simple sponsor, um, a small sponsor um, because of the budget. But uh, so I remember very clearly at 2014 when we, the concert was in 2014 in April. When we signed up the deal, it was end of 2013. We had seven stores, 2013, so 18 months after I launched the first store. Mm-hmm. And then by the time the concert happened, we had 11 stores. Wow. So that was a huge jump for us, yes. from seven to 11 yeah, in jump. that six months mm. time. Yeah, so that, that's yeah, especially with very limited resources and support and people to do it. That's right. That's so, right. so beyond there, what's the role on there? Because there's obviously clearly an acceleration that happened at some point. Yeah, can you talk us through that gap. Can you talk us up to like this pre-COVID? So that pre-COVID gap, because I imagine COVID's a bit of a line in the sand, isn't it? As yes. far as momentum drop yes. for a lot of brands, actually, I'm yeah. seeing in the marketplace. Well, actually, um, COVID hit us. Hit us like it hit all the other brands. Yes. but we actually, we actually grow the, with the branding Australia. We put uh, so many stores during the COVID years um, because we gave so much support to the franchisees. We um, waived royalty for very long periods of time when they mm. were on um, the government subsidies. Uh, we did not pass on the, you know, the 10 time, 10 fold transport fees at the time for, for due to COVID to oh, the yes, franchisees. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We absorbed all the cost. And, and because of that, the franchisees were able to survive the, the COVID that crappy period, yeah. That's right. And then because of that, a lot of the competitors and other operators, QSR operators, had left their sites, mm-hmm. which were really good sites. And so during that three years, we were able to pick up a lot of locations at a good deal. Yes. And because we've got the more multi-site owner franchisees on standby willing to open more stores, we were able to open a lot more stores. Just last year alone, I think if I got my numbers right, we opened 28 stores. <laughs> Yeah, so we, still, yeah. So before COVID, we had maybe 80, 70. Okay. And we pretty much you've almost. You've almost doubled. That's right. That that's right. There. Yeah. And, I, and I think that, well, brands that looked after their franchisees very well and were able to maintain numbers mm. and then had good, simple business models have emerged out very well. We're seeing this sort of two-paced markets um, in there. So that that's a very interesting interesting fact there. That almost doubled in growth in that period. I, I can't think think of anyone else who's got anywhere close to that. Yeah, so I, I'm proud to say because we were looking at the, um, the QSR reports and McDonald's, I think, only opened 22 stores last mm. year. So it's, yeah. it's been a huge year for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's quite incredible. So how did you get to 80 stores? So if you're 80 stores before COVID and you were 11 in 2013. That's right. What was that period like in, in building That was very stores? hectic because yeah. um, I was still operating out of the, the garage storage. Still? How, lo- how long were you in the garage storage <laughs> Until for? Until 2014. Okay, wow. Yes. Yes. So that that was the magical moment when, you know, I said, okay, we need to invest a lot more into this business in order to for it to to continue the growth that we yes. we expect it to to grow. So then we moved into a thousand square meter warehouse. Yeah, in Sydney. In Sydney yeah. in two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Okay. And that that helped you obviously. And that could have serviced around thirty five to fifty stores. Yes. Yeah. And I think we were saying in a previous chat we we're having you've got Six warehouses nationally or something now, is that's that right? That's right, that's right. Okay, so yeah. where, where are they? They're, so the three in Sydney, one in Brisbane and one in Melbourne, was Two it? Two in Brisbane and one in Melbourne. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, so what sort of team did you add on in that time? So you're, at, you're obviously getting in on more help to open stores and everything for uh, you. Yep. How did this? How did the business change in there? Have you? Well, we still had a very like lean. The culture of the business and everything, how has yeah, that changed um, over that time? We still had a very lean team. Yeah. Um, I think between 2014 and especially during COVID. Um, but I think these last two years we've been expanding exponentially. So now I think across the office and the uh, still lean, yeah, still <laughs> the lean, warehouse yes. still lean, uh, we've got about 30, 35. Um, team members? That's right. From one to 35. Yes, that's it. yes, yes. Okay. They're still lean because, you know, people look at us and say, oh, you know, uh, because our staff members, our team members, they wear different hats, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so. so what what sort of support does a Gong Cha franchise owner need? 
do you, do you find what what is what support do they ask for, and what support do you find yourself as a as I an think it, team it's giving? Cu- it's it's localized support. So it is what that business needs at that particular location. Is it to draw more foot traffic? Is it to educate customers about our product? Um, is it to to promote a certain product, mm. or is it to to have people know more about the brand? So I think it just depends on each location. That's that's because all other. Uh, you know, training, whatnot, that all happens before the business. Yes. The difficult part is once they start running the business and the difficulties that they run into once it's in operation. And that's how we support the business in, you know, tailoring what it is that they need and offering it to them. What sort of innovations do you see happening? Do you see yourself innovating in product? Like one thing I noticed in store today, and I was thinking, I think, oh, there's, there's no food. You, do you see yourself ever doing anything food that complements it? Do you, do you see that as a possibility? We have there? done Simple bites to yeah. complement the drinks, though, but never anything that's too heavy that that's that com- that becomes a meal. Mm. So we, we've had you know popcorn, we've had waffles, things like that that would you know complement beautifully mm. with a with a bubble tea. Do you see adding that sort of stuff in future, like um, to add transaction value or something? Is is that a path? Do you think, or do you think mainly just the focus on bubble tea? No, I think the focus is on bubble tea, but it's always good to have um, seasonal uh, bites to to complement mm. the, the drinks. Mm. Yeah, to to add. Just some some something new, yeah. What, what's your what's your looking at a crystal ball? What's your vision for what do you think Gongcha could be in the Australian market? Have you, have you got a number or locations or the role you want it to play or what? What do you see? I think Gongcha is a leader in in the the market for for bubble tea. We, we I want to go beyond bubble tea, mm-hmm. so it's not just about selling pearls and tea together, but. Um, it's selling the the, it, the the product is there, but I think it's it's selling the concept to 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 educate the people who has no idea what the product is. That's the reach we want to go. So we go beyond a little bit beyond just the the novelty of bubble tea, but how you can enjoy the product. There's so many ways, you know, sparkling tea, you know, fruit teas. There's all sorts of ways. That that's where I want the brand to go. Um, I can't give you a number because I think it's limitless. Right. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we, if we're able to put 145 stores uh, in 10 years, what can we do in the next 10 years? So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to to the journey ahead. Yeah. I think that's a great way to finish, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's a good way to finish? I think it <laughs> sums everything up so beautifully. Yeah. I think I think it's a, Lily. I think it's a wonderful story. I think. Oh, thank um, you. I think it's uh, inspiring to so many people and I, I think even a, a whole bunch of people, existing executives in franchising would look at your story and think what an amazing achievement you've done. So thanks so much for telling me, uh, telling us and our viewers a story today. Yeah. really appreciate having us here at Gong Cha. Thank you so much. Pleasure. <laughs>